right. <clears throat> so, for today, all of the groups that were just formed, one of the things you're going to need to do is today is the first day of trading for StockTrack. So, if you don't have your StockTrack account, one team member must sign up for StockTrack, all right, per team. It's about $26 <laughs> per team, debit or credit card, get the other team members to reimburse you. But the link for StockTrack is on the syllabus. You must sign up using that link because you have to be associated with this class, right? So remember, in the stock track simulation, it's going to be competitive, right? So to sign up for stock track, you'll go to the website stocktrack.com with the link. You can have up to two users have accounts to log in to your stock track sim. Once you log in. You will see a summary of your portfolio. All right. Now, when you first sign in, you will have a million dollars deposited in your portfolio. All right. This morning, during the first class, I showed them how to use StockTrack, so I actually bought Wells Fargo earlier today. All right. And you can see that I've made $290 in the last 45 minutes out of my million dollar portfolio owning Wells Fargo. So I guess they must be a little up in the day. But in any event, so the way stock track works is you can track your portfolio up here. It's a pretty intuitive menu. You can see what open positions you have. You can see your transaction history. You can see your uh, portfolio summary. And most importantly, what you'll eventually see are the rankings. So over the next two weeks, as people sign up, you can choose your own team name when you sign up just to identify you uniquely as a team name. Just choose something that is, you know, showable in, in a classroom setting. Uh, but we can see we get some names here like uh, Terp Bucks, and we got Team Turkish, Terp on Wall Street. So you can have a little fun with the name. But in any event, <clears throat> so these will be your competitors. So the idea is that StockTrack does not update the portfolios in real time. They'll update it the next day. So every day you can see your portfolio value against the peers. Now, I have four sections. So eventually there's going to be somewhere between 26 and 28 teams on this list. What we'll do in the next couple of weeks is we'll tell you who are the teams in this section that you're competing against. Because your grade will be based on the people in your section. Right? And the way it will work is that you start out with a million dollars of cash. At the end of the semester on May, whatever the final day is, it'll look at your portfolio value, and the company with the highest portfolio gets 10 points. The person with the lowest portfolio value gets 6 points in your section. And again, you're not competing against all the sections, just within your section, but you'll see all the other sections <laughs> in this portfolio ranking because we're all associated with this class. Right. So, <clears throat> again, you'll also notice under the trading that StockTrack gives you a lot of trading options. You can trade stocks, you can trade options, you can trade mutual funds, futures, bonds, spots, uh, currencies, commodities. It's a very flexible system. I've disabled almost all of it. Right. So, I've disabled the options, I've disabled the futures, I've disabled the spots. The only thing I've enabled is stocks. So you can buy, you can sell, everything else has been disabled, <clears throat> with the one exception of mutual funds. So you can also buy mutual funds, right? So it's an equity class, so we're going to focus on the equity side. I've put in a couple of other limitations. StockTrack allows for day trading. I disabled day trading. So that means if you buy it today, you can't sell it until tomorrow, okay? Another limitation, you're limited to 200 total trades over the course of a semester. I've been doing stock track for six years. No one's ever done more than 170 trades. So 200 should be plenty over the course of a semester. <laughs> Finally, $3 minimum price to buy or short. Right? So no trading in the pink sheets. So no future Jordan Belfour, whatever his name is, you know, out there. You actually have to do bigger companies. Right? So $3 minimum price to buy or sell a stock. And you can't put more than $250,000 or one quarter of your portfolio into any one stock. Okay, So you can't bet all million dollars 
on one company. You'd have to put four bets out there if you wanted to deploy all million dollars. Okay, so those are a couple of the limitations. You know, but generally you can buy just about anything you can in the real world within the subject of those limitations, including some international stocks. And you'll notice that it does a sharp ranking. So it will actually do a sharp portfolio ranking. We're not going to use that for your grading. It's just purely just cash. Who makes the most money this semester gets the best grade? Who makes the least money this semester gets the worst grade? And it's better than the real world because usually if you're the lowest performing team, you get fired. Right? So we're not going to fire you. You just get a lower grade. Right? So back to this. <clears throat> so for trading, let's say I want to buy somebody. So I think Google is a good buy right now. So what I'm going to do is I can either buy, so on trading for stocks, <coughs> if I own something, I can sell it, I can short it, and I can also cover my shorts. Those are my four options under trading the equities. So in this case, I'm going to buy Google. So buy the Goog. And when I type in their ticker symbol, give me a real-time quote. So Google today is trading at $1,145 a share. I can then buy, I don't know, 5,000 shares. I can do a market order. I can do a limit order. I can do a stop limit order. So for example, let's say I wanted to buy Google, but I only wanted to buy it if they dip below 1,100. So I could actually buy a limit order that says only buy it if it's 1,100 or below. Or I could buy a stop loss sell Google if it goes below, below, below 1100 so that way I don't have too much of a loss. So you can also put in some good to cancel uh, future trades or you can do market orders. In the real world you should never do a market order. The brokerage firms will just eat you alive especially because even though they're not technically allowed to do it they will never give you the best price. They're supposed to give you the best price but you will never get a good price if you do a market order. <clears throat> in any event so I'm going to do a simple market order here and hit preview and what it'll tell me is that this order total would have been $5.7 million. And I'll have a million seven of buying power. And at the same time, I can't put more than 250000 in one stock. So it'll also tell you when you've hit the limits. Right? So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in an order for 1000 <coughs> Here again, I'm still at 1.1 million. I can't be more than 250,000. So really, I'm going to do 250 shares of Google. Actually, I can't do 250. I'll do 200. 200 shares of Google. Preview my order. Hello. Uh, what's wrong with my browser here? I see a trading stocks. Reload the screen. <clears throat> I think our internet connection is uh, <laughs> slowing down in the section here of the Wi-Fi. So theoretically, if I were on the internet, I would have gone in here, I would have bought it, I would hit preview order, it would say, are you sure? And then I would say yes, and then it would confirm the order. Okay. So last but not least, you can also do what's called buying on margin. So you'll start out with a million dollars in hypothetical cash in your portfolio, but that will give you up to $2 million of buying power. So you can buy essentially double what you have invested on a margin account. I think the interest rate's like 10%. Okay? But essentially, you can do margins. The commissions are like $10, so they're really cheap. You don't have to really worry about commission. But let me see if I'm back on the internet again. So trading, stocks. So you can see my buying power because I bought uh, Wells Fargo earlier today. <clears throat> so let me go back to Goog. 200 shares. Preview order. Place order. Done. I now own 200 shares of Google, hypothetically. Right? So last but not least, I can go back here to portfolio. I can look at my uh, rankings. And as I said, tomorrow I can start to see how I'm doing against some of the other teams here. Yeah. What are the commissions per trade? It's like ten dollars. Oh, for every trade you do. Okay. Yeah, it's insignificant, but nonetheless, I at least put an e-trade like commission in here. <clears throat> All right. 
And then last but not least, there's what's called the order history. You can see who I bought. Now, for other teams, you won't see who they bought and sold. The only thing you'll see about your peers is their total portfolio values. You will not see their individual purchases. Right? Last but not least, this is a team grade. Okay, so your entire team is going to get the grade on your performance, which means it is your team's responsibility to manage who has access to the account and what trades you make on the account. Right? So you have to control your own rogue trading. Right? So if one of your team members gets in the account and goes crazy and loses a lot of money, it's going to hurt your whole team. So your team has to decide on who has rights to the account, when the team will be able to trade the account, who will be trading in the account. That is your team's responsibility. Okay? Finally, <clears throat> the last day of class, when you're graded, team with the highest portfolio value gets 10 points, team with the worst portfolio value gets 6 points. However, the other 5 points to get the 6, 5 of the 6, are the write-up. So what will happen is at the end of the semester, this is the other commission on your stock portfolio, is that when you trade, you're going to print out on the very last day of class a transaction summary. And you're going to have to write up one to two sentences on every trade you make with a rationale of why you do the trades. So more trades, longer write-up. Right? That's the real transaction cost in this class to doing the trades. So you have to give an explanation of why you did the trade. It doesn't have to be long, but nonetheless, one to two sentences. So that's the other thing you'll turn in the very last day of class. Questions about stock track? To do well in stock track, you have to pay attention to the market. That's really the key. That, that's why we do stock track in this class. Because in order to be successful, you got to know that, for example, what happened to Microsoft yesterday? They have a new CEO. So again, a new CEO is going to have an impact in the stock price. So now might be a, a time to think about what will happen to Microsoft. As a matter of fact, one of the problems Microsoft has <clears throat> when they were talking about the new CEO that they have to deal with is transition. I was showing this to a, a different class earlier this morning. Pull this up. File, open. This is a chart from an analyst with a company called Asimco named Horace Daidu. I actually like his charts. He, this guy puts together amazing charts. He does a really good job of just articulating facts in a way that are meaningful. And if you really want to understand why Microsoft fired Steve Ballmer, this chart is the great explanation of why. And what this chart shows you is on the left-hand side, these are Windows PC shipment growth rates. And this line over here is the launch of the iPad. And what you can see is that PC shipments have been declining. But what really becomes telling is the chart he put together on the right, which is the more brownish bars represent Windows sales, Windows PC sales. But then what he said is that add in the mobile market, add in mobile devices, iPads, iPhones, Android phones, Android tablets, to PCs and you get a very interesting picture. It's not that this market is shrinking at all. This market's growth is exploding. If you think of computing, including mobile computing, right? And that's the problem. Microsoft has no presence in all of those growth, growth opportunities. They have like 2% market share in mobile devices and nobody wants their products. So that's the real challenge for the new person at Microsoft as CEO, is how to turn Microsoft into a company that's relevant to the growth of this industry because PC sales themselves are shrinking. Matter of fact, the other damning information for Microsoft that's not on this chart was in the last quarter um, of sales of PCs were Chromebooks. What's a Chromebook? Anybody know? Does anybody have one? Do you have a Chromebook? Yeah. What is a Chromebook? It's just like, it runs on the Google operating system, and then it's just like nothing Microsoft. Everything is based, like your Word document is just connected straight to... To Google Docs, Docs. yeah. So, so basically, just imagine if you are somebody who likes Google Chrome, and essentially the Google Docs and G Drive, um, anything that you can do in a browser, you can do in a Chromebook. 
but that's all you can do on it. So you have to be connected pretty much to the internet to use it, and there's not really a hard drive. It's got some very limited storage on the computer itself, but that's the key. It doesn't really run Windows, and it doesn't use Intel processors. So it's they're really cheap. They run from about $129 to about $250. And they actually have some decent screen sizes. So unlike the netbooks of like five years ago that nobody could actually read because they were so tiny, like Chromebooks could be the same size as a you know 11 inch PC just without all the PC innards. And that's the problem is that now they're starting to take off and the major manufacturers are supporting them. And so at the high end, Microsoft is now losing out to Apple on the hardware side. They're losing out to all the mobile device makers who are getting all of the growth and the tablets are now clearly eating into PC sales when you look at this data together. At the low end, they're now losing out to Chrome. And PC manufacturers are starting to avoid Microsoft. Sony announced today, if you saw the announcement, that they're going to end or sell their VIO line of PCs. They're getting out of the business because they said, we can't make any money in the PC business anymore, so we're getting out. And they're running out of people to sell it to because even Lenovo, who bought IBM's PC business a couple years ago, what are they doing? What did they do last week? Lenovo. Lenovo. They bought Motorola. They bought Motorola. And they also bought IBM. And they bought an IBM server business. Because even Lenovo has realized they can't make any money in low-end PCs anymore. And that's the problem, is Microsoft's partners are bailing out. They bailed out of the phones. They're now starting to bail out of the hardware. It, Microsoft's got some real challenges, and it's going to start accelerating on them. So the new person's going to have to kick it into gear pretty fast. Right? And he was an insider. In fact, where did the new person from Microsoft come from? Their cloud business. And that's been a good source of growth for them. Fortunately, it's not where all their profits have been made historically. So I'll be curious to see how he handles that transition. <clears throat> all right, today we're going to talk about EIC. And we're going to talk about your first homework assignment, homework one. So this is lecture three. EIC. EIC stands for a framework called Economy, Industry, Company. E, Economy, I, Industry, C, Company. And it's really just a way of explaining part of the performance of a company. Because about half of the performance of a company is going to be due to external factors. So the EIC framework essentially allows us to discuss the external factors that will affect a company's performance. <coughs> so the first part of EIC is economy. And the real question we want to ask is, as the economy changes, what would be the impact of a change on the company? So, if the economy is getting better, what's going to happen to the performance of the company? If the economy is getting worse, what's going to happen to the performance of the company? So, can you give me an example of a company that would be very economically sensitive? Who do you think would be very economically sensitive? Alcoa. Alcoa, big steel maker. <clears throat> All right, so here's how we're going to track economic sensitivity. We're going to use Bloomberg. So you'll have to do your first homework assignment using Bloomberg. So if you don't have an account, you're going to be getting one very soon. So you'll log into Bloomberg and you'll look up Alcoa. And the screen that we're going to care about is a screen called Beta, B-E-T-A. Beta is just that. It is the beta of a stock. And by default, Bloomberg gives us a two-year beta for a company. So this is Alcoa's two-year beta regressed against the local market index, in this case, the S&P 500 index. Right? Now, for our purposes, we're going to want to look at a five-year beta as opposed to the default two-year beta. So I'm going to change this date range from 2012, February 5th, 2012, to 2009, and I'm going to hit enter and update it with the new data. Now you'll see that Bloomberg actually calculates two betas, what they call a raw beta and what they call an adjusted beta. Okay? Now the adjusted beta is really just a statistical argument. 
So statisticians believe in regression to the mean, and they believe in normal distributions. So what they do is they put in a correlation coefficient to, to basically, or sorry, a smoothing coefficient to basically move the beta closer to one, closer to the mean. And so the way Bloomberg does it is they take two-thirds of the raw beta, which is the actually slope of the trend line, and then, they, and then one, and then that becomes what's called the adjusted beta on a weighted average basis. So it just moves it one-third closer to the mean, right? So if it's a high beta, it'll move it closer to one. If it's a low beta, it'll still move it closer to one. So either way, they adjust it one-third closer to the one. It's called the adjusted beta. For our purposes in this class, for economic sensitivity, we're going to choose to use the raw beta to explain the economic sensitivity, the actual changes of the stock against the market. And here's the quasi-rationale that we're going to use, which is that generally, again generally, <clears throat> stock market goes up when the economy is better, and the stock market goes down when the economy is worse. So the stock market is kind of tied to the economy. And how is the company tied to the stock market? Therefore, how is the company tied to the economy. That's what we're really looking at in beta. So back to Alcoa. Raw beta 1.689. What that basically says is if the S&P 500 goes up 1%, Alcoa over the last five years tends to go up 1.7%. If the, if the S&P 500 goes down 1%, Alcoa tends to go down 1.7%. So they're going up much faster than the economy, sorry, than the S&P 500. They're going down much faster than the S&P 500. So we're going to say, yes, we think Alcoa is pretty economically sensitive. Now, here's the other nice feature of Bloomberg, is I can take this screen in the upper right-hand corner. There's an export button. I click on the export button, save screen as file, and it'll allow me to take a screenshot. So again, I usually put in the ticker symbol. So in this case, AA for Alcoa dash beta. You can name it whatever you want, but for your benefit, I'll name it ticker symbol and Bloomberg code, so you know which code got you to this screen. Hit save, and it's now on my desktop, So, or at least in my downloads folder. So my downloads folder where I saved it, there is that screen for the Alcoa beta. Right. So part of what I'm going to do for your homework assignment is I'm going to give you a company later today you're going to have to go into Bloomberg. You're going to have to take a screenshot of their five-year beta. You're going to have to grab it, save it to a desktop or thumb drive, and submit it to Canvas as part of your homework assignment. And then you're going to have to answer a simple question. Is the company sensitive to changes or to the economy? All right, and how sensitive are they? So let me give you another example. In the last class, somebody said Coca-Cola. What do you think about Coke? How sensitive is Coke to changes the economy? Ticker symbol KO. Why not? Why might they be less sensitive? Yeah, people still drink Coke in good times, bad times. They probably drink more soda in bad times, actually. All right. So back to this. So let's see. We go back to Bloomberg. Type in KO U.S. Equity. Type in BETA. Switch it to a five-year beta, 09, hit enter, and their five-year beta, 0.504. So where Alcoa was very sensitive, the aluminum company, aluminum company in America, I guess is what they were, um, was very sensitive to changes in economic conditions. Uh, Coke, not so much. So the market goes up 1%, they go up half a percent. If the market goes down 1%, they go down half a percent. So, yes, they have some tie to the economy, some tie to the market, but not nearly as much as Alcoa, the aluminum company. And so that's what we need to understand about the two. And if I wanted to take a screenshot, again, export, save screen as file. I'll call this KO-beta. So that's one of the first parts of your homework assignment that everyone in this room will need to do by Monday. Questions about this? All right, the other part of what's eventually going to be your group project, you go back to the PowerPoint here, <coughs> is we have a general idea of economic sensitivity, proxy the beta. Next question is what's going to happen to the economy? 
So as we've been talking about in the news, we've been talking about sort of the mixed signals we're getting with economic activity in the news. So we have to kind of understand what's going to happen to the economy, and as the economy changes, what's going to happen to our company. Now, there's lots of sources for economic data. For the U.S., the one source that we're going to focus on this semester, there's many, there's one source we're going to focus on is an index called the LEI. It stands for the Leading Economic Index, and it's published by an organization called the Conference Board in Washington, D.C. And right now, the Conference Board is kind of famous for two economic indexes. Every month, they publish a consumer confidence index, just like the University of Michigan does, and it's pretty closely followed. It's one of the two major consumer confidence indexes. And every third week of every month, they publish the LEI, the Leading Economic Index. And over the last few years, this has also been a pretty heavily followed index. When this index comes out, it's going to be looked at very heavily. So just like when the Manufacturing Index comes out, that's an important one. When the LEI comes out, it's an important economic activity indicator. So the idea of the LEI, and again, to get to their index, you want to go to this website, conference-board.org. Don't go to conferenceboard.com. Not safe for work. Do not go to that site. At least not on a Maryland computer where they're tracking your name. All right, so back to this. <clears throat> so here's the idea of the LEI. And I know it's kind of hard to see on the main screen. It's a little washed out. But this is essentially historical recessions represented by the gray bars. So the gray bars are the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight recessions. The blue line is the LEI index. And the items on the right are the, the things that make up the LEI index. But here's the idea. Generally, the LEI index starts to trend downward before recessions start. And generally, the LEI index starts to trend upward as recessions are ending and before they actually end and we're heading towards recovery. So historically, they have signaled economic activity six to nine months or two to three quarters into the future. Not saying it's always going to be right, but that's basically one of the things that we're trying to understand is what's going to happen in the fall 2014. That's why people are looking at the LEI index right now to kind of get the sense of the future direction of the U.S. economy. Right? So <clears throat> the Commerce Board also publishes what's called a coincident index, which again, the idea of coincident, that index tends to go down right as we're getting into recessions. That index tends to go up right as recessions are ending. Right. They also post what's called a lagging index. The lagging index go down after we're already in a recession, and the lagging index tends to go up after recessions are over. In fact, unemployment is one of the factors of the lagging index. Right. Back to this. They also publish this chart. Every team, as part of your second group project, will have a copy of this chart in your presentation document for your group PowerPoint and your written paper. This is the more short-term version, so it's a closer look at more recent data of the LEI and the CEI on one chart. Right now, this is data that goes from their January press release. You will have data in your final presentation from their April press release. Right? So some, sometime on or about the third week of April, the new press release will come out. You'll have the screenshot in your PowerPoint. Every group will have to have this. <clears throat> and based on the last one, so this is the January one, which is really December economic data. Then this is what we're looking at, what's happening in this LEI. And you can see that the LEI has been going up pretty consistently since the trough of the recession, the Great Recession. But right now, the, the uh, slope of this line is starting to level off. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Is it actually kind of peaking? Or is it pausing and going up? Or is it starting to trend downward? And that's going to have a big impact on stocks coming up, especially with all the other uncertainty out there. So people are going to be looking at that pretty closely every month. To get to the LEI index, this screen, what you'll do is you'll open up a browser. You'll want to go to conferenceboard-board.org. On their website, you'll click on U.S. indicators here on the right, and one of the indicators is the leading economic index. And every on the right-hand side is their press release they release every month. 
and in their press release is that chart. So that'll be where you get your screenshots from. <clears throat> that's the one that's in the PowerPoint in the deck. Right, questions about that? Simple enough. All right, you won't have to do this for the homework assignment. You'll have to do this for your group projects. For the homework assignment, you'll need a beta, and you'll need to answer the question, is the company sensitive or not to changes in the economic environment? Right? Or very sensitive, less sensitive. So we'll just do one more practice. Pick another company. Let's see, who can we do? Uh, somebody mentioned Caterpillar in the last class. What do you think about Cat? Well, if you think they're pretty seasonal, then that should probably infer something. Well, I guess in the spring they're high beta. Okay, so, but also, go ahead. Oh, so they're, um, they're like a construction company, so, I mean, a lot of their deals probably come from the government. And, uh, and so generally construction... Yeah, they're going to be very tied to probably economic strength because of that as well. Yeah? Housing markets. And to some degree, the housing market, which, yeah. So let's look. Let's look at Caterpillar. So we start typing cat. There they are. Cat, U.S. equity. Hit enter. And then we go to beta. <clears throat> and then we switch it to a five-year beta. And their five-year beta, 1.574. So again, probably pretty sensitive to the economy. So around one kind of goes up and down with the economy. Well above one goes up and down much faster the economy. Below one, not as sensitive. Goes up less, goes down less. Negative beta, inverse of the economy. Okay? So that's really what we're going to be looking at here. All right. So let's go back to our PowerPoint and continue on. I, industry analysis. Industry analysis is going to help us understand how attractive financially is the industry. Now, we are going to use a very specific definition of industry attractiveness in this class. And it will be different than what you might use in other classes. Industry attractiveness in this class is not subjective. It's objective. Right? And specifically, an attractive industry in this class is an industry with a positive spread. So in order to have an attractive industry, your industry has to have a return on invested capital greater than its cost of capital. Otherwise, it's not an attractive industry, and it's based on observable data. Yes? Um, that's for the average, right, the industry? The industry it's the average. industry average, not the company. So it's not, is the company attractive? Is it's the company's peers? Is the industry attractive? But wouldn't, like, a company... I'm just saying, like, hypothetically, like, a company that's in an industry with a negative spread, and that company has, like, a very high positive spread, wouldn't that mean that that company... We're talking about the industry first. Okay. That's what I said. We're not doing the company analysis first. We're going to start with, is it an attractive industry? Then, the C part of the EIC, how's the company competitive advantage, and how's the company <coughs> doing in that industry? But right now, it's just, is it an attractive industry? And again, it's not your opinion. It's like, I think this is a lousy industry. Well, what's the data say? Right? And that's the point. What's the data say about the industry today? So, how do we figure out what the data says about the industry today? I'll show you in just a second. But here's the point. Let me show you the data. Go back to the data first. <clears throat> All right. This will be the second screenshot you'll need to do out of Bloomberg. So, let's say we go back to Alcoa. All right. AA was their ticker symbol. AA... U.S. equity. So we're back to Alcoa. We'll get the aluminum industry. The screen that you're going to use a lot this semester to answer this question is called RV. It stands for Relative Valuation, and they just renamed it Comparable Analysis, but it's RV. So in case you wonder why it's called RV and says Comparable Analysis, it used to be called Relative Valuation. <clears throat> so here is the point. When you go to RV, it'll show you a bunch of peers of the company against across a bunch of financial ratios. So the advantage in Bloomberg of the RV part is that you can look at a bunch of companies 
and financial performance across a bunch of ratios for those companies. Now, by default, Bloomberg will give you this comp source up here in the left-hand corner, which is the Global Industry Classification Service. So that's pretty much the standard industry classifications that Alcoa is in, and, and Bloomberg has looked up all the other publicly traded companies that are in that code, and it's shown them as their peers. Okay? What we're going to use in this class, this semester, is what are called the Bloomberg comps, which is under the proprietary section. In the Bloomberg comps, a physical person at Bloomberg, an analyst, has gone through the industry list, and they have curated it. They either took out people they thought wasn't relevant, or they added people they thought were more relevant. So the Bloomberg comps is a curated list. The GICs, the Global Industry Classification, and the ICB classification are just the standard industry codes. And it'll show you multiple ones, but in this case, we want to use the Bloomberg peers. Now, next, you'll also notice that it'll give you the option to do comparables on the whole firm, comparables that are in the base metal business, and comparables that are in the fabricated metal business. So if Alcoa is in multiple lines of business, you can look at comparables against their lines of business. Here's the one challenge with this, which is it's still all of Alcoa. All right. So even though I selected the fabricated metal competitors, it's still the entire Alcoa business. It's not the fabricated metal part of Alcoa. All right, so that's the one challenge when you look at a company against a certain sub-peer group. But nonetheless, you can do sub-peer groups as well. For your homework assignment, you're going to do it based on the whole firm, the whole firm comps. And finally, you'll see over here on the right, you can choose country of domicile. That basically means, since Alcoa is a U.S. company, it's going to look at U.S. peers. But let's say I wanted to switch to global, like I wanted to see somebody else in here, like Hindalco, big Indian company, then I could quickly see global peers in addition to U.S. peers. But for purposes of your homework, we're just going to use U.S. peers for the company that I'm going to give you later today. All right. So this gives me the list of, in this case, simple example, Alcoa's peers. What I can then do is I, there's a series of tabs. So on the series of tabs, I can see some data as I go to different tabs. So for example, comp sheets, I can go to operating stats, and here's a bunch of operating statistics. I can click on ownership, and here's some ownership data. I can click on credit, and here's all the credit ratings of all the peers. Right? And then what we're going to do is I can click on custom, and I can quickly create my own custom screens. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a column in the middle of the screen called ROIC, Return on Invested Capital, which is a Bloomberg field. Hit Enter, and it's going to ask me which ROIC do I want, and I want the one from the latest year of the company. I can also do a quarterly one or a latest filing one, but I want the latest year. Hit Enter. There's the ROIC from the latest filing, latest year, latest fiscal year, on a 10K basis. Next, I'll go back to Add Column, and I'll type in WACC, Weighted Average Cost of Capital. I'll select that field. I'll hit Enter or Go. So I now have the Weighted Average Cost of Capital for all those companies. Final step, select Stats. Market Cap Weighted Average. Hit Update. I now have the average ROIC based on market size, and I have the average cost of capital based on market size for the aluminum industry. So just select stats, and you can choose whatever stats you want, but one of the stats is market cap weighted average as opposed to a straight average. And I don't want to do a straight average because I don't want some tiny company that has some giant ROIC to distort my industry ROIC. So I want to weight it on the size of the company. And again, that's just a, a standard feature within the Bloomberg software. Other questions? Yes? 
first the first line would be the market average. And then take the market cap data average, that's the market. So right now, for this industry, which the industry is Alcoa and its Bloomberg selected peers that are publicly traded, based on the most recent data, so a lot of this is now the 2013 data, 13.4% average ROIC. Cost capital for the industry, 10%. So you're going to have to have this screenshot. This is screenshot number two of your homework assignment. So I'm going to give you a different company. It won't be Alcoa. You're going to have to get their five-year beta. You're going to have to get their, what we're going to call their RV screenshot of the weighted average cost of capital and the ROIC. <clears throat> get the screenshot. Go to the upper right-hand corner. Export. Save screen as file. In this case, Alcoa-RV. Okay. Now, here's another nice feature of Bloomberg. There's an option in the middle of the screen that says Save As. I can click on Save As. I can call this 443 space spread. Hit Save. Now, I'd already saved this in the last class. That's why it's going to ask me if I want to overwrite it. Hit OK. And it put a little box here of it saved that template that I created. So anytime I come to the custom RV screen, I can go to a pre-saved template. So once I create my template, I can always go back to that template for any company. So it, again, makes it very personalized very fast. Very nice feature of Bloomberg. In fact, I'll show you one last feature of Bloomberg, which is if you right-click on the ROIC, you can graph the column, and it'll give you this really cool looking graph showing you from highest ROIC to lowest ROIC, the ROIC by peers of the industry. So again, you can do this nice little analysis as well as a chart option in the software. But back to the RV screen. So again, RV, custom, click on my little tab, my template's there. Select stats. This is the only thing is the template doesn't store the stats. So you always have to reselect the market cap weighted average. Now you'll notice, and I wasn't expecting this, but this is actually a good lesson, that the ROIC has changed. It's now says 7%. How'd that happen? Here's the hint. Look in the upper left-hand corner, and what's it say for comp source? It defaulted the GICS comp source. And we said we were going to use the Bloomberg comp source. So that's the point. If I have different peers, I'm going to get a different ROIC. So, so we all get the same answer in our homework assignment, Bloomberg peers. Now I'm back to the data I had before. Yes? I'm doing it right now. And this is a video. So you're always welcome to go back and check the video. Other questions? All right, so back to this. Attractive industry has a positive spread. Is this an attractive industry? Yes. So what you'd have to answer is yes, and you have to say, because it has an attractive spread, and then here's the final point. In this class, not only for this homework, but for all future assignments, including grades, this is a finance class which means you got to use numbers. You can't just tell somebody, looking at the data, it's an attractive industry. Because you can just flip a coin, you got a 50-50 chance of being right. All right. you got to refer to numbers. If you don't refer to numbers, then you don't have right answers. And your TAs, who went through this last semester and are going to grade you, have had that ingrained into them. So if they don't see numbers in your responses, they're just going to give you no credit for your answers. So if you say, yes, this is an attractive industry, you'll get no credit. Right? You have to say it's an attractive industry because the industry ROIC is 13.4% and the industry cost of capital is 10.01% and the industry has a positive spread. That's how you have to answer the question. Very, It's a subtle nuance, but it's important to do. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, 
Here's the, the final part of EIC. I'll just say it while I'm on the screen. C is competitive advantage. Does a company have competitive advantage? Again, in this class, I have worked with literally probably 100 big companies over the years. I've never been to a company, no matter how poorly they perform, that doesn't believe they have competitive advantage. They all do. In fact, I depressed the last class because I said half the people in this room are below average, just by definition. Now, nobody wants to be called below average because you're all above average people, right? And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who like to say you're good and special no matter who you are. But statistically, half of you are below average on whatever criteria we measure, just based on where you are in the industry. Well, competitive advantage says... In this class, to be a competitive advantage, you got to be in the top half. If you aren't earning better than your peers, you don't have competitive advantage. You can earn a great rate of return because you're in a good industry. But the only way you prove that you're better than everybody else is you actually outperform your peers. Now, specifically, that means you have to have a spread greater than your peers. So if you don't have a spread greater than the industry spread, you don't have competitive advantage. Now, since the cost of capitals are typically pretty close for most firms, ROIC is often the differentiating factor. But let's look at Alcoa. Does Alcoa demonstrate competitive advantage? Yes or no? No. Why not? Negative spread. Specifically? Need a number. They have a 2.22% ROIC against an 8.28% WAC. That's the negative spread. So in this case, they have no competitive advantage. Now, here's the interesting thing. Can a company have a negative spread and show competitive advantage using the definition we just gave? Actually, yes. That's right. If their spread was not as bad, negative, as everybody else's, then they're kind of like what I would call the queen of the pigs. Right? They're the best of the worst. And they could still have competitive advantage. Right? The flip side is also true. You could have an industry where everyone is performing really well, but you don't really have competitive advantage because you're just in a good industry. You're not really outperforming all of the other good players. So when we think about companies this semester... I want to change your point of view on how you view a company as thinking about it, is the company's performance explained by the industry or its relative performance to its peers in the industry and how does it look? And then how will that be changing over time? So is the performance improving over time because it's in a good industry or is the performance improving over time because the company's actually getting better? Right? Or is the company getting better but the industry getting worse? Because right? that's part of the problem that Microsoft is running to. Microsoft was in a great business 20 years ago. But now they're in a business that is mature, starting to enter the slow declining stage. So no matter how good Microsoft is, it's going to be really hard to maintain their level of performance as their industry matures and starts to get declining. So that's what we need to start to understand about an industry. Right? And again, I want to use observable data. Questions about that? Yeah. Quick question about Bloomberg. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you set this screen up so it takes like the difference between the two? You can How create like custom that? fields that don't exist in Bloomberg that are your own fields like spread. Mm -hmm. And that's more advanced. And I actually did that. So, for example, on the two over, I have a screen called Operating ROIC, which actually uses the definition of cycle time that we do in this class. And it's actually a Bloomberg custom field but it's only a custom field in my account. So I've actually asked our Bloomberg sales rep if I can find a way to get my custom fields into your accounts, but you have 160 individual accounts. So that's what makes it a little tricky, but we're trying to figure out a way to easily do that, or you can create your own custom fields, but that's the idea. I can quickly create a cycle time or spread or whatever uh, custom field and store it in Bloomberg. All right, right now, though, spread is not a field in Bloomberg. Other questions? And you can, um, so in, the, in, your customs, uh, in your custom fields, you can mm -hmm. like divide and subtract stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, look at, if you actually look at my definition for cycle time, 
uh, I can edit this column. Or sorry, edit the uh, edit the column. Come on, let's cancel. And this field will come up if you search any company. So. Yeah. So if I go back to uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Show definition. Uh, actually, it doesn't have a definition because I created a custom field. But the short answer is yes. You can actually do simple algebra, algebraic exp expressions. And what's also nice is you can actually do custom fields which refer to other custom fields. So I can actually create a custom field, and I can use that custom field in a different formula to create further custom fields. And it actually does it all in real time. It, it's actually pretty nifty. Okay. It's, like as Excel. It's, it's like you're in Excel. Right. You just have to be on a Bloomberg terminal. That's the yeah. danger of doing this. Because you've got to be on the terminal and be able to do it. All right, so back to this. Let's pick a different company. How about, give me a company. If it allows you, to, if it puts it up as a ticker symbol, then yes. I did put like the London Stock Exchange, so I think you should be able to do some European stocks. All right, so back to this. You said 3M? So what's their, is it MMM? Yeah. Okay. So ticker symbol 3M, RV. Let's a little bit of RV. Sorry, a little mouse problems here. RV. Uh, I want to use Bloomberg Peers. Custom 443 spread. Select stats. Market cap weighted average. <clears throat> so, good industry? Is 3M in a good industry? Yes or no? Why is it in a good industry? How do we know? 16.16 against 937. High spread for the industry. Does 3M have competitive advantage? They have virtually the same whack as the industry, and their ROIC is 20%. <coughs> so clearly, 3M is not only in a good industry, but 3M is outperforming the peers, and they have competitive advantage. Stock. There you go. Does uh, Becton Dickinson, BDX, do they have competitive advantage? Becton Dickinson, given the data on the slide. No. Even though they're creating value, why can I say that Becton Dickinson is creating value? Because they have a positive spread. The problem is they don't have as much of a spread as the rest of the industry. So what I would interpret this to be is Becton Dickinson has a positive spread because they're in a good industry. It's not that they're doing anything particularly better than anybody else. They're just in a good industry. That's the way I want you to start thinking about this. All right? Questions about that? All right, so let me go back to the PowerPoint. So that's going to be the second part of your homework assignment. So your homework assignment is really going to be getting two screenshots. One is the beta, the five-year beta. And the second is going to be getting the RV screen with the WAC and the ROIC. So ROIC first, then WAC. The yearly, and the, using the Bloomberg comps. And don't do global, use U.S. Right, or country domicile. <clears throat> then you're going to have to answer three questions. So you have to upload two screenshots and answer three questions. Question one is, how sensitive to the market conditions are, is this company? Two, is this an attractive industry? Why or why not? And three, does this company have competitive advantage? And you can't just say yes or no. Yes or no equals no credit. You have to refer to numbers and give your rationale. Right? Now, final step. Every time you take a Bloomberg screenshot, because the terminal has a unique serial number, at the bottom of the screenshot, is a unique serial number and a timestamp. No sharing screenshots. This is an individual assignment. So every person 
has to go and get their own screenshots, even though they're the same screenshots, because you must practice using Bloomberg. If you don't know how to use this software, you're going to get lost, very, very lost in further, more complicated assignments. So the only way you're going to learn it is if you sign up for an account and go and actually start typing some stuff and getting some screenshots out of here. So even though it's a two-point assignment, I'm going to treat this, if you share screenshots, as an honor code violation. All right, not that I want to be difficult, but if you don't use Bloomberg yourself and get your own accounts, you're just not going to take advantage of the software. You're not going to know what's going on later this, this semester. So you must do the screenshots yourself. No sharing of the screenshots, even though we're going to have 160 people taking the same screenshots over four sections. All right, so very important to take your own screenshots. Yes, questions? Stretching? Yes? Is there an easy way to take a screenshot? So again, at any screen in Bloomberg, the simplest way to take a screenshot is to go to the screen, upper right-hand corner, there's an export button, save screen as file. You can also view screen as an image, but this, or grab the screen, but simply sc save screen as a file. It'll save as what's called a GIF file, GIF. That's the simplest way to do it. So it's real easy to do. The company will be on Canvas at the end of the day. And it's just mainly because I have two sections after this one, and I don't want the sections after this one to do the homework during class. So after my end of final class today, I'll post it later today, the assignment with the company, and then you'll have until Monday to complete it. So it'll be due on Monday. Yep. Just a quick thought of looking at the company. Did you see like one of the companies that has a big list, it like skews that they have? Then what you do is you go to this edit comparable list, okay. and then you just let's say I want to get rid of, I don't know, snap on, and then I hit uh, save, then snap on is gone for the list. Okay. Not for the homework assignment. Okay, but, just, but yeah, when you're working on your group projects or doing other analysis, that's actually one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take out like these companies that skew the list. Or you might say, you know what, this isn't a company I really think is a peer. Or I want to add, because I can do the same thing. If I edit the list, I can actually add, you know, I want IBM to be part of this list for God knows what reason, but I could add them. And then suddenly IBM is part of this peer set. Uh, there's there's some ability to do some sorting, but you don't drag and drop, unfortunately. And then you can also look at, again, sub-peer groups. But notice when I added IBM and saved it and deleted Snap-on and saved it, now my comp source is custom. So I've essentially created my own custom list, custom peers. Now, you can only have one custom list per company. Right? Every company can have its own custom set of peers, but it's only one custom list per company. All right, other questions? All right, last couple comments. Going back to the PowerPoint. So what this slide shows us in the PowerPoint is it's a chart from the McKinsey reading this week. And it shows us that historically, the average industry, and this is about a 40-year period of time from 1965 to 2007, the average industry earned about a 9 to 10% ROIC. So that's average for the S&P 500. However, some industries did better, and some industries did worse. The best performing industry was pharma, and the worst performing industry historically, last 40 years or so, was airlines. And then the lines represent the range of ROIC performance. But here's the idea. It's not just that 9 to 10% is the average. Some industries do a lot better. Some industries do a lot worse. Some industries do average. How do we explain whether an industry is doing good or bad? Well, to do that, we're going to use what's called the Porter Five Forces model. So if you're not familiar with the Porter Five Forces, you need to go look it up on the web. It's pretty easy to get. But basically, Michael Porter, who is a Harvard Business School professor, back in the 80s, created a model for explaining industry performance called the Five Forces model. And this is a graphical representation of it. And as part of your group projects, and this will be in homework two, <clears throat> we're going to use the five forces model to explain changes in future industry performance. Right? So specifically what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, buyer power is one of the forces. So do the buyers, our customers, have power over us? Do we have power over our customers? 
If we have power over our customers, we're probably going to make more money, have better ROICs. If our customers have power over us, it's going to be harder to make money. We're probably not going to get as good an ROIC. Supplier power, same thing. If we have power over suppliers, far easier to make money. Third force, substitutes. So, let's say I'm flying from D.C. to Raleigh-Durham, okay, which I'm actually going to be doing. So, is there an alternative to flying to Raleigh-Durham from D.C.? I could take a bus. What else could I do? Take a train or I could drive. So there are substitutes to going versus plane, and that may affect an airline's ability to set prices. Now, I told you, in a few weeks I'm going to Madrid. Does that change? Does the viability of substitutes change if I go to Madrid? Absolutely. So that's the other thing we have to think about is, are there substitutes? What are substitutes? And what is the viability of a substitute? As a matter of fact, there's another substitute that's increasingly coming up for business travel that airlines have to worry about. It's not just planes, trains, automobiles, and buses. What's another substitute? And not just boats. Online. I don't have to go out of town. I could do an online meeting, a virtual conference, and avoid the travel altogether. And that is becoming an increasing substitute that airlines didn't have to deal with 10 or 15 years ago that is becoming more viable every day. So again, we have to think about it just not today, but how it's going to eventually change over time. By the way, force number four is entry barriers. Is it easy to get in the industry? So for example, I want to start up a cell phone network. Is that easy to do? Why not? I'm sorry? One, it requires a lot of money, which I probably don't have. Customer data, but what's an even bigger barrier? Regulation. Regulation. And what's part of the regulation? What do the government regulate? Yeah, they, they, they license the airwaves. And if you try and do an unbroadcast license over the airwaves, they're going to shut you down pretty quick. So, so that's the point. The government controls the airwaves as a first step. And those airwaves are very tightly controlled, which is why it's so easy for Verizon, Sprint, um, AT&T, and T-Mobile in the mobile business to actually make a lot of money. I mean, sure, there's some rivalry amongst those players, but they all make a lot of money. And the reason that particularly AT&T and Verizon make a lot of money is because there's no competition. And the barriers to get into the mobile business are high. So I might say, gee, I'd love to get in and do the mobile business, but if I can't get in and have the airwaves, or if I can't get in and get the cell towers or access to the towers, I'm out of luck no matter how much money I have. So, you know, even a, you know, a couple years ago when the Chinese tried to get in the U.S. market, the U.S. government blocked it for technology reasons. So who was that company um, that sells telco equipment? Huawei? Yeah, Huawei. That the U.S. government basically said you can't buy any Huawei equipment. And they were trying to make a cheap push in the U.S. to have lower cost cell tower equipment. And the U.S. government said, no, for technical reasons, we're just not going to allow it. You know, competitive reasons. So, again, national security reasons, whatever they are. But again, creates barriers to entry. Chinese do the same thing. If you want to go into China... They have very specific bands on their phones. And if you don't have those bands on your phones, you can't just take your phone into China. They have a version of CDMA called, what's it called? What's the version of the network? Does anybody know? They don't have the straight GSM and CDMA in China. They have something else. They have like a variant of it. But in a way, it creates a barrier to entry. Because if your phone doesn't have those bands, you can't just go into China and use your phone. Because, right? again, it's, it's controlled by the government, the frequencies that are on there. That's a different band that's used in the rest of the world. So back to this. The final force is rivalry. What is the intensity of the rivalry in the industry? And the biggest driver of rivalry in the short term is supply and demand. When there's excess supply, it's hard to make money. When there's excess demand, it's far easier to make money. Right? So here's what we're going to do. Not for the first homework, but for the second homework. Let's we'll talk more about this on Monday. But the idea is we're going to use the RV screen to observe the overall performance of the industry today and assess it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the five forces model to explain the overall spread today. So the five forces explain the spread. We're then going to predict five years out how these forces will change, if at all. And that is going to give us a prediction for future ROIC for the industry. So we're also going to use this to help predict future spreads for an industry and talk about future competitive advantage. So again, future ROICs for company.
that's what we're starting to get a process to be able to forecast. But before we run, we have to walk. So your first step is homework one. Two screenshots, three questions, look by five today, it should be posted, do Monday, 10 a.m. for all sections, will be the homework assignment, and it'll be a different company than the one we addressed in the class. Remember, one of my TAs has office hours today, the other has TA, TA has office hours tomorrow, so if you have any questions about this, you can also talk to the TAs, right? Attendance starts on Monday. All right, so we're not going to start attendance today, but starting Monday, we will start taking attendance. Otherwise, have a great weekend.